Yeah. Start at 20. Yes, Okay, April. Okay, I'm going to continue with uh, our treatment of the Ising model. We had some uh, problems with the identification. Let's go back to the problem of identification. So I have CI that they are annihilation operators. So CI acting on vacuum gives zero. And now I want to make a connection with the Pauli matrices. So I set CI equal to sigma I plus. So this vacuum state has to be identified with the up state. And sigma plus on up gives you zero. And sigma plus on down state gives you the up state. Therefore, I need the down state to be identified with one particle state. Hence, when CI acts on the one particle state, it gives me the vacuum. It kills the only particle there and gives me vacuum. So I also have my one particle state identified with the down state. And CI dagger will be sigma I minus. CI dagger on vacuum gives me one particle state and it is concurrent with sigma I minus on the down state to give me the up state. So this guy, 1 minus 2 CI, I guess CI, this operator. If it acts on the vacuum, this term gives zero, so it's just the vacuum. If it acts on the one state, CI brings that to zero, CI dagger brings it back to one, so it is 1 minus 2 on 1, therefore equal to minus 1. So sigma Iz, now 
this has to be sigma i z. So sigma i z on the down state gives me minus the down state. And on the upper state gives me plus upper state. Finally, CI beggar CI anti commutator is sigma i plus sigma i minus anti commutator and is zero. Everything okay. Thank you. So next calculation I want to do is this one at CI. I better clean this thing. So the problem is that sigma i, sigma j commutator is zero, i not equal to j. And this is not good because I want c, i, c, j, even if not on the same site, to anti-commute. So I use it a different notation for CI, which is equal to I of K is smaller than I sigma I Z times sigma I plus. So for example, C1 will be sigma 1 plus c2 will be sigma z1 sigma 2 plus and so on That's what this formula was. <coughs> What's the problem? No, no. Nothing? No, yes? So asking, uh, why it is a problem uh, that sigma and sigma j to make for me? I want to make it correspondence from the Ising model to the fermion model. In the Ising model, sigma i, sigma i plus, uh, sigma i minus sigma i plus anti-commute on the same side. So do fermions. So this is okay. But this then
this then is a problem because here I have C I dagger C J or or I should say let's let's do it this way because this is what I the calculator equal to zero I not equal to J. So I cannot just put C I equal to sigma I plus everywhere. So this what I wrote there which I did my calculations with is incomplete because this is now a problem. This is a commutator. I want anti-commutator to go from Isaac model and Pauli matrices to Fermi's. And I solve this problem by putting this prefactor here. This prefactor, what it is doing is that on the lattice, you are at point I. I multiplied by a string which starts at the origin and goes up to that point, but with a sigma z direction. And I'm going to show you that this solves the problem, that they will now anti-commute everywhere. So I take this form, and now let's take C i C j, i a smaller j than j, so that I can do the calculation. But obviously, it doesn't matter because if it is the other way around, I put C j first, since I have to rewrite this again for the replaced version. You could, you could, but something very difficult then comes in. Okay. The, the thing is that in, in, the, in two dimensions, fermions and bosons are in some sense equivalent. Ah. So if you do, if you want to do that, then you have to, in the end, do that boson fermion transformation, which we can do, but I think this is simpler. I'll, however, there is another representation which can replace this in terms of just bosons. It's called the Coulomb gas representation of Isinger. Another question? Yes. Sorry. <laughs> You didn't get the original picture of this business of a string. A string. So here is the problem. I, do, I, I want this, but this is what I have. So the solution is that instead of saying ci is equal to sigma i plus, I say that ci is equal to a, a string times sigma i plus. A string comes from origin up to sigma i plus. The question is, what should the string be? What is the origin? What is the string? What is the string? What is the origin? The physics of a string or the mathematics of it? The mathematics of it I am about to explain. The physics of it is that in many physical problems, we find that Having just a particle here doesn't work. You must have a string connected to it. It has started with the Dirac monopole, and then parafermions, and the twist field in the Ising model all work only with the string. So what I need to show is that now this combination if I take this combination and just use the Pauli matrix rules, it will give me an anti-commutating CICJ. This is what I want to show. So it's equal to pi k is smaller than i, sigma i z, sigma i plus pi k is smaller than j, 
זיגמא K Z זיגמא J So here, k is smaller than j, means from 1 up to j. So I can take the 1 up to i, then there is a sigma i par z, and then pi, another string which is k bigger than i is smaller than j. So this string has three parts. This part commutes through that and becomes this is squared. Then I have sigma i plus. Then I have this sigma i z. Then I have this string. This is one, so I have sigma i plus sigma i z the string k j to i sigma k z sigma j plus. So this is the only part of a string is left. The rest of it was identical to that, and its power vanished, not vanished, became one, disappeared. And just left me with a sigma i z here, which does not commute with that, so it's sitting. This calculation needs i is smaller than j. Now keeping a still i smaller than j, but writing it in opposite, opposite way to that. It is equal to pi k is smaller than j, sigma k z, sigma j plus pi k is smaller than i, sigma k z sigma i plus again first part of the string goes away to here and cancels that I have pi k is smaller than j bigger than i sigma k <coughs> Z, exactly the same trick as here. Then I have sigma But when I do that, here I have one extra term which I keep outside, sigma i z. Yes, this j is bigger than i, so it includes i. Because i is smaller than j, it can go through all of this without problem. So it is equal to sigma i z, sigma i plus. j i which is exactly this guy.
but with the difference that this term is in opposite order to that. And because they anti-commute, if I put it on the other side, it will be minus. Hence, if I add them, they vanish. And I have achieved that only using matrix Pauli algebra. So Pauli matrix is algebra. So CI can be represented as sigma I if I take this complicated form. This complicated form is something like that. It's not bad to just check it for something easy such as C13 plus C3, C1. C1, C3 will be sigma 1 plus sigma 2, uh, 1, Z, sigma 2, Z, sigma 3 plus, plus sigma 1, Z, sigma 2, Z, sigma 3 plus, sigma one plus. So you see sigma one plus is next to sigma one z. It cannot commute through it. But here, sigma one plus can commute through this string and it becomes And now this term has opposite order to that, so the sum is zero. So this, this is the sort of formal way of doing this particular case. Then I use these uh, annihilation creation operators. I go through the mathematics I showed you on Friday, and eventually we arrive at that action. It's only a question of really just do the algebra and then do a Bogolibov transformation to bring me to the correct canonical form. Now here I have to identify this action with a conformal field theory. And to do that, I have to calculate its central charge which is a calculation I don't want to do. I don't really expect you to be able to do that sort of calculation. So there is a calculation that is starting from that action will show what its central charge is and just believe me that if we, that avoid the calculation that C is one half. So C equals to one half conformal field theory corresponds to 2D Ising.
With this knowledge, I can look and see what sort of operators I have here. I have three primary operators for c equals to one half. C equals to one half is m equals to three. So three primary operators. I can put them in a diagram, which would be the two two state. State one, two, two, two state. Just three fields. And these operators are the unit operator the sigma operator and the epsilon operator. So wait zero zero one half zero and one sixteen. This guy is epsi and this guy is unity. We certainly have a unit operator for the fermion field, and I argued that the conformal weight of epsi has to be one half. It's the engineering weight there. So epsi z epsi w equals to one over z minus that. Now, this is a little, yes? yes. I saw you draw these boxes. Do they have any meaning? <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> yes. C is one half, for which it was equal to 1 minus 6 divided by m times m minus 1. And for this to become one half, m has to be three. I gave you a formula for what fields I will have. I have fields phi pq such that p goes from one to m minus one and q is smaller or equal to p. So I always will have a triangle for P. P will have so I will have if I draw P on this axis, it will go up to M minus one, which is these boxes here. And then I build the pyramid up with P taking each, so this is the p equal to m minus one row. This will be p equal to m minus two row until p equals to one row. And then q for each value of p will be from one up to p. So it will be q1, p1 here, q1, p2, q2 to pq2, p2 here, and so on. No, these will all have different conformal weights. 
there is in some conformal field theory papers you see they they talk of degeneracy. That's because you can, in fact, imagine the whole table, and so these guys will be degenerate to these guys. But I am not drawing them. There is no degeneracy. They all have different conformal weights. And there is a formula for them as well, if I can find it here. I don't remember the formula by heart, and I cannot find it here. There is an HQP, which gives you the conformal weight of each box. But the, the, each, for each of these have a conformal weight, because these are operators. Each box is a conformal operator, for which you have to calculate H and H bar. And for each box, I have a formula, but there exists a formula, but I don't have it here. But for the Ising model, I know that it's this, these guys, 1 half and 1 over 60. These numbers, yes. Which one? This, what? There are two numbers. Is, uh, yeah, it, okay. Okay, for, for uh, a theory which is unitary and real, H must equal to H bar. So, in fact, here I have a one half zero plus a zero one half, which I showed you that. I have two fields, epsi and sub uh, bar, and they together form a doublet here. And I have a 16, 1 over 16 for this box, and I have a 0, 0 for that box. And so, what, what is the relation between the three? The three? Yes, the three sets of boxes. They are just different representations. No, they are the members. Yes, they are different representations but they are members of the same Hilbert space. So the Hilbert space of the Ising model is the V00 plus V1 half 0 plus V16 and what are these V's? These are the V's which you obtain by, by ladder operation, which I told you each one of them forms a triangle, and it's the sum of them. Yes. Because I have two fields there, one Fc and one Fc bar. Fc is one half zero, and Fc bar is zero one half. In the other cases, we have the same. 
We have, yes, we have one field which acts as both of them. They are, they are, they are, so here I have written only the PQ. I have written their names here, which I call operator one, operator epsilon, operator sigma. Here I have written their conformal weights. So these three sets, these three boxes are equivalent. The problem which I have now is the final identification. Final identification, I have, this is the unit operator, so it must exist, and I have no problem with that. Now, I, it means that I have two non-trivial fields in the Sigma model. But in the Sigma model, sorry, in the Ising model, I have two non-trivial fields. Two non-trivial fields is a, is a problem because I have, I see here only one non-trivial field. So this box is FC, which you see on the screen. What is this guy? And this FC is, does not make me happy because Epsi Z, Epsi W is equal to 1 over Z minus W. And this is just the wrong color rate, correlator for Ising. So there has to be another field which corresponds to this box, the sigma field. And where does this field come from? So there, there has to be another operator in the conformal field theory of the Ising such that when it acts on the vacuum, it creates the 1 over 16 estate. So I assume the existence of this field sigma. Which is equal, which gives, which gives me one over z minus w. To the power one eight. And this means that eta is 1 over cot.
Το της ε. Τι This should be the spin of the Ising model. So I must have another operator in the Ising model which I can correspond to this. So that's, I have. Yeah, but in this model, we, we use only the sigma. No, but you have another operator. But sorry, can I have So these three triangles are three different maps of the same? Same concept. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so this, this, uh, shape here. Yeah, it's doing the same thing in two different ways, right? You're doing the same idea in different ways. So here I have the PQ yeah. or QP. Here I have their conformal weights, which I have some formula, I, complex formula for HPQ. Here, as he pointed out, I have to identify them against the Ising model. This is the unit vector, the, the unit operator, obviously. This is the a spin. So what is this? This is, in fact, equal to sigma i, sigma i plus 1, the, the, the energy density. So in fact, the Hamiltonian is the sum of energy densities. This operator does exist in the Ising model, but it's, uh, you, you really have to do this calculation to then see it. And then it does have that 1 over r correlator. Yes. The difference, uh, sorry, between epsilon and psi. You, they are. Uh... So this has this is the same thing, but epsi is in the field theory. Epsilon is in the lattice model. And the final result is important, that I, I have used CFT to obtain the critical exponent and in fact using this diagram I can calculate all critical exponents of the Ising model. So this C equals to one half theory is in fact exactly the same as the 2D critical Ising model.
I know that this operator must exist. So I claim that there is some operator which when acting on the 16 gives you, on the zero gives you the 16 operator. I can, to be more precise, I have to explain a lot more about Ising conformal. I don't want to, I don't really want to ask you to know all the details of conformal filter. I want you to just have a, a little knowledge about it. Yes. So what I, what I did in these last two lectures, I showed that the Ising model has RG as conformal field theory which was the my starting the start of my talk was that these lattice models these two dimensional models which show conf, uh, critical behavior, thermal critical behavior, they can be looked at from another point of view. One is the RG point of view, and the other is CFD. And from both of them independently, you can derive the critical exponents, which is the whole point. M is equal to three, yes. So our C is zero. M should be four here, right? The back one up. Ah, plus one. This also means, and it's a, it's a little deeper, that if these two are the same description or descriptions of the same model, they must be related. And there is a very deep relationship between RG and conformal filter. I don't want to go into it now, but it, it is connected. They are connected. Now, I want to to give you a second example, percolation, that shows you that this holds. So we can look, we want to now look at the percolation model, model the percolation problem, to see how RG is defined for it, and also to see how conformal field theory is defined for it. It's a second example where these two concepts come in. So what is percolation? So the problem is that is the image you see here. The physical problem is the image you see here. You have a porous media, and water can percolate through it to the other side, very slowly but surely. It does percolate. And it percolates if the holes and spaces in the percolating medium are connected from one edge to the other. They could be very small, so a small amount of water will flow, but over a long time, you can have this situation where the water from the surrounding field has collected in a sinkhole. Or you have seen it in, in uh, buildings where you have a wall, Water this side and water slowly seeps through and you get dampness in the room. Yes? So, sorry, the, the normalization group uh, estimates the critical response. Right? It's not exactly. 
does not exactly determine the feedback response. Why? No, it, it's not. It does not determine them because I am not clever enough. <laughs> but if I can do it completely and exactly, it is exact. The calculation I did for you was because I'm not clever enough, I do first order calculation. Somebody is smarter, he will go to the second order. But if you are very smart, you can calculate all the terms, then it becomes exact. Theory in the same way, it, it, exactly. determine exactly. it determines exactly, yes. Now, let's look at a second example, percolation, which I told you what the physical problem of percolation is. So let's go forward. So I make a an abstract mathematical model for percolation. That is, this is what I do. I take a lattice and I randomly place uh, some bonds or some uh, nodes as on. So I've placed this bond as on, this bond as on, but they are completely uncorrelated. I just choose a bond randomly and put it on. If you have a finite lattice like what I have here, in uh, some time, the whole lattice will be covered. So it is not much fun. It has to be an infinitely large lattice so that these guys, some of them will be collect connected, some of them will be alone. This is called bond percolation. This is called uh, site percolation. And the question is, what is the probability P at which, if I do this, I will have a global cluster? Global cluster is tantamount to water seeping through. If there is no global, cluster water will only go halfway. So pictures of bond percolation, you see, as the probability of placing bonds increases, you get a denser and denser image. Hence, um, it is very probable that you have a global cluster here. It is almost, almost equal to one, the probability of finding a global cluster. This is less than one. You do not find a global cluster here. So in the image, when the lattice is large enough, you can feel the problem that it is actually a difficult problem to solve. And the, 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 the sort of main question is, what is the critical probability with which if you place bonds, a global cluster will fall. Another way to look at it is I set a boundary condition, all of them on here, all of them off here. So percolation cluster has to start right here. And then it moves on the edges only. See, this, this red line is moving such that whites are on its right-hand side and blacks are on its left hand side. And it, it will just give me a path through the percolation cluster. If it was percolating, this path would have to go to the other side. But as it is, it is not going to the other side. Let's start with the easy problem a study percolation in one dimension. So when you want to look at percolation in one dimension, the problem is very easy. So I'm very slow in explaining percolation because 
it's a less known model than Ising, so maybe there are people in the audience who don't know what percolation is. Those who know can uh, rest a little. So I have a one-dimensional chain. And with some probability, I fill the bonds. Just take bonds randomly and fill them. Question is, when will I have a path which goes from here to there? And the answer is obvious. You only will have a total path if probability is 1. Because it's one dimensional, it has no way of going around. It has to go through every link, so the probability of the percolating probability is 1. So this is an easy problem. We can leave it and uh, not very interesting. Now, if I go to into two dimensions, then I have a lot of variety coming in. Because in two dimensions, I can change the shape of the lattice as well. So I can have 2D honeycomb or 2D square or 2D triangular. And the problem changes because the, each of these uh, lattices has different coordination number. And on each lattice, I can ask what is the difference between site percolation and bond percolation. They are not the same problem. And finally, in this last line, you can see that in three dimensions, the problem is very different. So fortunately, we are only dealing with two dimensions. And uh, in many instances, the problem of percolation gives critical percolation is one half. The reason is that there is, I, I am looking at percolation of up and up from bottom to top with black lines, as I explained. However, you can always reverse the problem and say, I'm looking at percolation of left to right with white bonds. <coughs> the two must give the same answer. So if bottom to top is percolating, definitely left to right is not. So it's only at the critical point where only critically you have one global cluster in one, you, will have a, you may have a global cluster in the other. So in many situations, 2D percolation has the answer of one half. But uh, so I'm sorry. Also, have a difference between bond site and bond percolation. They are they are not the same because you, this dual point does not exist on the site percolation. Because, for example, on the two D square lattice. I can use this dual picture of black and white for this bond percolation. But you, I cannot for the site percolation. Now, the next question is, what is the order parameter? Just like Ising, I need a 
Yes. Yes. Yes, uh, it depends on the on the shape of the underlying lattice, and uh, um, it's a mathematical fact. I don't have an answer for you why it. Well, you would expect that on if you look at it from a large scale, it should not matter, but it does. When I come to the renormalization group theory of it, you'll see how exactly it is. It's op it operates. It. The shape of the lattice directly affects the RG structure. Especially that I will write down a conformal field theory for it, which does not see the shape of the lattice. So that question is difficult to answer. So order, the order parameter. So I need a, a parameter which changes at the point of at the point of uh, percolation probably at the point of critical percolation from zero to one. So on this side, I have uh, a, 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 a global cluster. Uh, below it, I don't have a global cluster, and you can. You can easily do a, a, a computer simulation and on a very a small lattice, it's 20 by 20, you will see this change over. Sorry. However, this is not quite satisfactory because I, I am going, I want to claim that I have a continuous phase transition. So I want an order parameter. This cannot be the order parameter. I want an order parameter which, uh, which slowly changes. So I would like to have an order parameter PC which doesn't jump but changes like that. So the, the sentence on the top says, take the mass of the largest character. Don't take the probability of connection. The mass of the largest cluster is that you have a percolation problem, and you take the biggest cluster, you calculate its mass, its mass being the number of on points, divided by the total area this density will be a better order parameter. It will have this, this behavior. Rather than what I've drawn there. This is a much better order parameter. Now, you can define exponents for the percolation problem. And uh, you see that uh, they, they change. 
they near the critical point, they change with a set of exponents. We are exactly dealing with a, with a continuous critical phenomenon. So percolation, this sort of a standard, this is, I, I call it a standard percolation because now there are many models of percolation where they adjust the way that you choose the next uh, on point. Um, but this is the sort of the very first and simplest model, and these are the exponents you get. Now, I want to get these exponents using RG. So comparing to what I said in the general description of critical phenomena, I don't see any symmetry breaking. To see symmetry breaking, you have to do a trick and approach percolation from a more complex theory, the Q state Potts model. And of course, there is no ergodic theorem breaking because these two go together. We have a scale invariance. The scale invariance is shown in the fact that my physical quantities near the critical point are power laws. And I will I have a conformal field theory describing uh, percolation, but it's a problematic conformal field theory because it has central charge equal to zero. Central charge theory is either null, meaning that it has only one operator, or it is non-unitary, and, and therefore it is, has to be non-unitary to be a little more interesting. And if it is non-unitary, it's a logarithmic conformal field theory. A little explanation here is good. So in conformal field theory, I claimed that OPEs are of this shape. Uh, sorry, the correlators are of this shape. But another shape is possible. a logarithmic term multiplying it. So under a scaling, you see that something strange will happen. If you scale them, you don't get just the same theory, but this, this prefactor will repeat itself. So if I put lambda here, this will now then end up looking like plus a term which is log of lambda times It turns out that this is allowed. You can have this kind of com field, conformal field theories. And in fact, this percolation CFD is of this form. It has this strange way of transforming. then it has to be non-unitary. Oh, what? 
everything is gone. <laughs> okay. Yes, just a second. Yeah. If C is equal to zero, we should have M equal to two. So yes. shouldn't we have only one field, so the identity? Yes. So obviously it doesn't fit into that picture. And that is why when CFD was uh, invented, all this was left aside. So here is the question. When you have this formula, y is dot m equals 3. What happens to m equals to 2 and m equals to 1? This gives you c equal to 0. This gives you c equal to minus 2. Yeah? So in the, when the first CFD was developed in 1982, these theories were left aside. They said M doesn't take value 1 and 2 because these theories are non-unity. But now we know that they exist, and these are logarithmic CFDs, but they are non-unitary. They were left out because unitarity implies that this M has to start at 3. When CFD was first developed, it was developed by people for particle physics. So unitarity was very important because it had probability of observation, etc. But we want to use it for a statistical mechanics. And we can, we don't need to interpret the norm of states as probability of observation. The only thing we need is a good correlation function. And it produces the right correlation function. Yes. Uh, I want to ask why uh, use of sine and phi in, uh, instead of uh, in the first line we, we use the, the same field. Yes, I told you that phi phi is like that, but in LCFD in in logarithmic conformal field theory, this is zero. So, in fact, you need another field to, to make it non-zero. I don't want you to learn like logarithmic conformal field. I just want you to know that it exists. I, if, I, if we start on logarithmic conformal filtering, we will go to another year, and I'll be talking here until next meeting next year. So some things I just need to talk about, but not continue. Yes? Sorry, I didn't get it. A state of your system? No. Um, phi of z does something at point z. This much I know. But what it does at the moment, I don't want to specify. But what I will, as I go ahead, what I will say is that at the, what it does at this point is that it changes the boundary condition. So it becomes important as operators acting on the boundary of the, of the problem. Whereas uh, in the Ising model, which is a proper conformal field theory, sigma of z created a particle at z. Or I should say epsi of z. Here, I don't want to say that. This will do something, but let's wait for it. But it's not an obvious interpretation. OK, so
So this paper It was not the first paper, but it was, was an important paper in uh, getting the results for uh, the RG of uh, percolation. And I'm essentially going to follow that paper. It's also, it's an, also an example this is Eugene Stanley, which is a very famous name, as you know, in Estatmec. It's an example I always tell my students that publishing in PRL is not the aim. You can publish it in less known journals with a good result. It's the result that matters, not the journal. Since they get very depressed, they submit to PRL, and the editor says, this is not the good quality for our journal, and rejects it. Nature is even worse. So, it's very nice, very nice paper. It says, it asks, how can we implement RG for a percolation problem? So for, for RG, as you know, we have to block some, block some the lattice. So suppose I have, I'm doing RG on this lattice, and then according to cardinal of block summation, I want to take a, a combination of sites as my block. And now the new block is this. Yeah? How am I supposed to redefine my percolation problem so that it goes with, it maintains the meaning in the resummation? In the, in the Ising model, I had a Hamiltonian, so it was very easy or in some sense very non-trivial as to how I do it because I sum and then I have to work out the interactions. Here I just have a geometrical picture. So what I do, what these guys suggest you do is that you make this site, when, when you have this big four site, so you have four sites involved, you make the big one on if the subsites are in some sense connecting below to above. Yeah? So, for instance, if you only have these two, you cannot call this on because you, there is no connection from here to there. But if, if it, it is enough to have this guy on, then I can call the big block on because there is a route from bottom which goes to the top. And in this way, and in this way, in the new lattice, I will have a new probability of sites being on, which is a function of old probability of sites being on. And this function, the shape of this function, will depend on the microstructure of lattice intimately. Because if it was triangular, a different criterion would 
give it on. As it is rectangular, another criterion is giving it on. So I have to work out R given a particular microstructure of the lattice. Yes? Either. In fact, this paper says realization group for site and bond percolation. Until this paper was written, people were thinking that it cannot. So in this paper, they solve this problem. Site and bond will give you the same, can be treated with the same mechanism. All you need to do is to define what you mean by connectedness and uh, stick with it. So now, I'm going to say something which is a little difficult to justify. If P is, if you, are, if you give me R of P, and P is smaller than PC. Then the summation process will take you to P prime equal to zero. You agree with that? Because the lattice is filled in a dilute way, and cutoff of resummation will make it diluter. At each step, it becomes diluter and diluter until P becomes zero. So if, if I, in fact, this would be P prime of R of R of P, this is it. Yes? Lambda is the rescaling. So in this case, lambda is 2. Lambda is the rescaling. I allow A, the lattice spacing, to go to lambda A. Okay, so if you agree with this, then the next statement you will also agree with. If P is bigger than PC and you do that, then lambda tending to infinity, P prime will tend to one. So in fact, if you're above percolation, above percolation threshold, you have global uh, clusters, and repeating this resummation process will make the lattice darker and darker until it is totally dark. So on the this P in percolation is in fact playing the role of temperature and I have a critical percolation, a critical value of P for which percolation happens. Above it, I go to infinity. Below it, I go to zero. And this is a, a repulsive point. These are attractive points. Yes. The parameter lambda going to plus infinity it means uh, uh, we iterate the renormalization an infinite number of times. Exactly. So because it is two in one iteration, I multiply it again, it becomes four, eight, and so on.
So I hope you have taken this down. I'm going to clean it. So I expand R of P around the critical point. Exactly that for the RG equations in general, but here I have a specific case. This is equal to PC by definition because this is the fixed point, and I have P prime minus PC is equal to the RDP at PC times P minus PC. So this is delta. P prime is equal to lambda to y times delta P. And this y, hence, is equal to the log of dr dp at pc divided by log of lambda. And this is my critical exponent. And I expect, of course, for this to be positive. This is positive, so this has to be bigger than E. Okay, I can call it, okay, you are right. This is, this is a scaling exponent. But from this, I can obtain the critical exponents. They must come exactly function of this. This operation, the correlation length changes. Yeah? I do this operation, I go from P to P prime. And this is given by this function, R of P. And as a result, I have correlation, a new correlation length over a lattice, which is differently filled, depending on whether P is below or above PC. So the correlation function changes, hence the correlation length changes. And the correlation length changes by a simple factor. Or 
I can interpret this as the length of the, the size of the biggest cluster instead of correlation length may be easier to understand it that way. But x z of p is equal to p minus p c to power minus nu. Or x z p prime is delta p prime to power minus nu, which is equal to this guy So this has, this has to be, so this is R. This has to be just that factor. So this y of t here has to be equal to 1 over nu. Of course, we knew that because when we did RG calculation, we knew that y of t, or the exponent of a scaling, a scaling exponent as correctly pointed out, in the temperature direction is just 1 over nu, the exponent of the critical length. And the critical length here can be interpreted as the correlation length or easier perhaps to interpret it as the size of the biggest cluster. Okay, so next step, let's do it in one dimension. Always the simple problem first, So I have, in one dimension, I take three sides and make it into one side. What is the probability that, so, sorry, I would call this say, site full if I can already go from here to there. So I must have three sites on before I can go from here to there. Hence P prime is equal to P cubed. In other words, the function, the form of function R is fixed. Clearly, p is smaller than 1. Critical p here is 1. p is smaller than 1. This will always go to 0. And there is no other section except p equal to 1, which will definitely go on to 1.
fixed point is p equals to p cubed. So p equal to 0 or p squared equal to 1, which gives you p equal to 1. p equal to minus 1 is not admissible. So two fixed points. And one dimensional percolation is finished. Next problem, let's look at site percolation in triangular lattice in 2D, because it's easy. So site percolation. Triangular that is so I have this formation and this can be on or off. So this is off, this is on. Now, the criterion was that I set a whole triangle to on or off, depending on whether I can go from one side to the other. Here I have three sides, so I have to reinterpret this demand. So in fact, I will accept it from connecting any side to any side, so it's enough to have just two to make this on. So in fact, three, two positions, two, I have a, three of them on, definitely the triangle is on. And if I have just two, also on. So P prime equals to P cubed plus three, P squared, 1 minus P. So 2 on, 1 off. This is R of P. Yes. So dr dp. Sorry. Let's say r of p is equals to p is the fixed point. So I get P critical equal to zero, P critical equal to infinity, uh, sorry, one, P critical equal to 0 0.5. Solution of that equation. Three fixed points. These are trivial fixed points. 
and this is the interesting fixed point, and that's exactly what we know from other calculations. Now, the RDP, I need the RDP at PC. Yes, um, but the thing is that all the fixed points of the RG equation, this is the RG equation for percolation. All the fixed points of the RG equation somehow are critical. They are special cases. They are that a scale dependence disappears. And... Uh, From a, from a physical intuition, it is obvious that these are fixed. These are points which are, in some sense, critical. They are, the partition function has problems at this point. Although you don't even have a partition function for percolation. So this is equal to 3p squared plus 6p to calculate that at PC equal to 0 0.5, three halves. And as you know, in the triangular RG, since each three, three, triangle is reduced to one point, Lambda is square root of 3. Hence, nu, nu is uh, log of square root of 3 divided by log of 3 halves, which is equal to some a strange number. And we know this to be true from simulations, exact calculations, etc. So this is a very, <coughs> yes. Yes, you can. Uh, 
I think what you are saying is exactly what this guy was saying. <laughs> yes. The point is that this method is okay. Whether I can do it or not is another question. Since I am very foolish, there are many things I cannot do. But maybe there is some a smart guy in Princeton and he can do it. So I don't throw away the method because I cannot do it. Yeah? You keep the method, maybe somebody can do it. On a stable point, will give you the critical. In general, without the structure of the lattice, in general, without paying attention to the structure of lattice, I argued, and it's an acceptable argument, that the critical point is unstable, the two points are stable. This we know. Now, for each particular lattice, for each particular lattice, I get a different R. And that the shape of that R will give me the exact value of PC. Now, as Nahid says correctly, you may not get the shape of R right, but, this, but if you get it right, it will give you the PC. So percolation has very nice, easy generalization group action. What about this conformal field theory? Tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> One of the exercises.